Hi guys, welcome back. Hope all of you are doing good. So I'm back for doing some amendments which are applicable for June and December 22 exams guys. So I just want to give some disclosure before I start with. This amendment class is only for those who have already attended the regular class and have already studied from my regular study material. So here I would be covering the changes in income tax which is applicable for June 22 and December 22 exams guys. Clear? So in this session we would be covering only exclusively the amendments applicable for June 22 exams. And here I have also prepared a material where I would be covering the amendments. So this material I have tried to align with my regular study material which already is shared with you guys. So it would be helpful for you to refer to both the materials and study. And whatever amendments or new provisions are there. In this amendment material, I have highlighted in red color so that it would be easy for you to recognize it. Fine. And to help you with the understanding of the topic or where exactly it is there, I have also given some background or something which is in black color. So whatever is given in black color, the contents here, it is not a change. There is no amendments in that. Whatever I have highlighted in red color is the only change, guys. Fine. Chalo. With this disclosure, we shall start the amendments of income tax which is applicable for June 22 and December 22 exams. Chalo guys. First coming to chapter 2, basic concepts of income tax. So there, there is something called as Finance Act. What is Finance Act? Every year, the uh, finance minister of the country will be presenting the budget in the parliament. One of the main component in that budget is Finance Bill. So finance bill has to be approved in both the houses that is Loka Sabha and Rajya Sabha. Then it will go to the president. Once president gives his assent, the finance bill will become finance act. So there is no change in this. But the finance act applicable for June and December 22 exams is finance act 2021 guys. Finance act 2021 which is effective from 1st April 21. Clear? This is a change. Next coming to assessment here. So what is previous year and assessment here? It has been defined in income tax. But there is no change in definition. But the previous year applicable for June and December exams, 22 exams is previous year 21-22 guys. Previous year 21-22. And the assessment year applicable would be 22-23. The income earned in previous year is chargeable to tax in assessment year, right? And whatever we have done or whatever we have covered in our regular class, is for previous year 2021 and all the problems are also done accordingly but in your june 22 exams the problems or any questions on problems would be for previous year 21 22 guys including like residential status calculation everything would be for previous year 21 22 clear yes next coming to the next change in chapter 4 that is with respect to tax rates applicable for different types of assessi for assessment year 22-23 okay now for a resident slab rate is applicable so basic exemption limit is up to 2 lakh 50 to 2 lakh 50 to 5 lakh 5 percent 5 lakh to 10 lakh 20 percent more than 10 lakh 30 percent but in case of resident individual who is 60 or more the basic exemption limit would be 3 lakh and in case of super senior citizen that is resident individual 80 or more the basic exemption limit applicable would be 5 lakh. So in that scenario, if the assessee has reached the age of 60 or 80 at any time during the previous year, including 1st April of the assessment year, he is eligible for higher basic exemption limit benefit. Same way. So if any assessee is reaching 60 or 80 on 1st April 2022, which is assessment year, still he will be eligible for higher basic exemption limit. Guys. Clear? Yes. Next coming to tax rate for company. Domestic company different tax rates are applicable. So only one change is there is no changes in rates. If the domestic company has not opted for any of the new scheme and if their turnover or gross receipt during 1920 does not exceed 400 crore then the tax rate applicable for them is 25%. Sir what if the turnover is more than 400% sorry 400 crore then the tax rate applicable for them would be 30 percent clear so what we have covered lastly in our regular class was previous year 1819 but now 
from previous year 21 22 whatever is covered here is previous year 1920 not 1890 clear that is the change here next coming to chapter 5 that is heads of income in that the first head of income income from salary section 15 to 17 so there is a point here tax treatment of provident fund which i have given it in my regular study meter this table you can come to that point so nothing change here with respect to this there is one new provision added which i have given here in fourth point and highlighted in red color this is the only change or we can call it as new provision so what is it now let me first explain here see with respect to interest whether on employer contribution or when whether on employee contribution for a statutory provident fund it is completely exempt under section 1011 and in case of public provident fund also it is completely exempt in case of recognized provident fund it is exempt but only up to 9.5 percent sir what if it is more than 9.5 percent assume it is 12 percent interest on recognized provident fund balance is 12 percent in that case in excess of 9.5 which is 2.5 percent would be taxable in the hands of the employee okay then coming to unrecognized provident fund it is not uh, means exemption is not available it is taxed now coming to the new provision which is given in the fourth note here here they are telling if the employee or SSE contribution is more than 250,000 in a year, then the interest exemption is not available on that excess part. On that excess part and this new provision is applicable only from 1st April 2021. Before that, there is no provision applicable for this. Yeah, what is this? Let me read. However, the exemption under section 1011 or 1012 would not be available in respect of income by way of interest accrued during the previous year to the extent it relates to amount or the aggregate of amounts of contribution made by the person or employee okay exceeding 250000 in any previous year in that fund on or after 1st april 2021 that means if the employee or the ssc is contributed is own we are not talking about employer contribution here they are not talking anything with respect to employer contribution here now if employee or SSC is contributing more than 2,50,000 to their PF fund, then the interest on that excess part is not exempt. For example, let me take an example. In previous year 21-22, I contributed 3 lakh to my PF account. 3 lakh to my PF account. Is it in excess of 2,50,000? Yes, sir. How much? 50,000. So, on this 50,000, whatever interest is earned is taxable. No exemption is available. But on 2,50,000, yes, exemption can be claimed. Clear? So, only the interest on the amount exceeding 2,50,000 would be taxable in the hands of employee tax. Clear? Yes. Next. Continuation. If the contribution by such person or employee is in a fund in which there is no employer's contribution, then higher limit of 5 lakh, higher limit of 5 lakh would be applicable for such contribution and interest accrued in any previous year in that fund on or after 2021, 1st April 2021 would be exempt up to that limit. Sir, what is it? See, if there is no employer, normally both employer and employee will contribute to the PF. Agree? If there is no employer contribution, normally they are trying to talk in this second paragraph about PPF because in case of public provident fund, the employer contribution won't be there. Okay. So, if there is no employer contribution, then the higher limit of 5 lakh is given for you. If you are contributing more than 5 lakh in a year, then on that excess of 5 lakh, interest, whatever you earn, would be taxable. For example, assume I alone is contributing to my PF account and I am contributing 6 lakh in previous year 21-22. In that case, whatever interest you earn up to 5 lakh is exempt. But on that excess 1 lakh, whatever interest is earned is taxable. Is taxable. Okay. Next. It may be noted that interest accrued on the contribution to such funds up to 31st March 2021 would be exempt without any limit, even if accrual of income is after that date. Now, sir, this provision, new provision came into force from 1st April 2021. It is completely a new provision. So, is that applicable for the contribution which is already made before 1st April 2021? No. So, even before 1st April 2021, even if the contribution is more made more than 2,50,000, more than 5,000,000, still, this new provision is not applicable on that. 
Yeah. And please be careful. This new provision is applicable only for employee contribution. Sir, what about employer contribution? For employer contribution, there is something called as perquisite calculation under section 17 to 7, 17 to 7 a, which we have already covered in our previous sessions. Yeah. Yes. Next coming to PGPP head that is profits and gains of business or profession, which is third head of income. There is no changes with respect to calculation and all. One change here is with respect to audit. Audit of accounts or tax audit is covered under section 44 EB. So their first point is specifying if a person is carrying on the business and if his sales or turnover in the previous year exceeds 1 crore, then he has to get his accounts audited. But there is one exception for this, which is given here. In order to reduce the compliance burden on the small and medium enterprises carrying on the business, the threshold of turnover or sales limit of our tax audit requirements has been increased from 1 crore to 10 crore, subject to following conditions. That is, for a small business person, the turnover limit now is not 1 crore, but 10 crore. When, if they satisfy the two conditions, both the conditions has to be satisfied. That is, whatever the total inflow is there, it not more than 5% should be in cash. That means minimum 95% they should have received in any form other than cash. Okay. Next, whatever total payments they make in a year, not more than 5% should be in cash. That means minimum 95% they should receive, sorry, they should pay in any mode other than cash. If both this condition is applicable or satisfied, then the turnover applicable for you for the purpose of audit is 10 crore, not 1 crore. In all other cases, it will be 1 crore. And what is the change here, sir? See, previously it was 5 crore. But by Finance Act 2021, they increased it to 10 crore. That is the change. All other things remain same. The only change here is 5 crore is increased to 10 crore. Previously it was 5 crore. Now they have increased it to 10 crore. Clear? And why I have given like this is guys, so it will be helpful for you. You can make this change, some small, small changes means you can make it in your regular study material only. So in your regular study material, go to this particular aid of income, go to this particular section, there 5 crore will be there, scratch it and make it 10 crore. Simple, done. Okay, that is why I have made a separate uh, material on amendments, which will be aligning with my regular study material so that it will be easy because you guys would have already studied from the regular study material so now it will be easy for you to refer to this and study it fine sure next coming to the fourth head of income that is capital gains here one important change is there our new provision has been brought so in capital gains the capital asset okay when capital gains will come when there is a transfer of capital asset in the previous year so capital asset is defined in section 2 subsection 14 or 2 clause 14. Okay. So the only change here is they have added one new asset which is given in C point. All other things remain same guys. Now capital asset means I am straight away good to C point. All other things remain same. Any unit linked insurance policy or in short we call it as ULIP issued on or after 1st February 2021. Okay, only if it is issued on or after 1st February 2021, it will be a capital asset. To which exemption under section 1010D does not apply on account of premium payable exceeding 250,000 for any of the previous year during the term of such policy or the aggregate amount of premium exceeding 250 in any of the previous year during the term of such ULIP in any case, in a case where premium is payable by a person for more than one ULIP issued on or after 1st February 2021. Sir, what is ULIP? ULIP is a policy which is taken to cover two things. One is to cover life, the other one is to take, uh, get investment exposure. Investment exposure. So this ULIP policy is taken by the policy holder with two intention to cover their life plus to have as an investment exposure. Fine? Sure. Now, so ULIP is nothing but life insurance policy. So ULIP, unit linked insurance policy. And sir, what is it exactly? See, if I take a ULIP policy, whatever premium I pay every year, I can decide where this amount can be invested from the insurance company. Whether it is normally it will be invested in the shares of some other companies where I would be getting more return, guys. Yeah. Chalo. So three conditions has to be satisfied for a new leap to be a capital asset. What is it? 
you leave has to be issued that means i should have purchased it on or after 1st february 2021 sir what if it is purchased before that it is not a capital asset okay then when you leave expires or when the policy matures exemption is available under section 1010d but some restrictions are there so when you leave matures exemption should not be available under section 1010d then only it is a capital asset sir what if it is exempt under section 1010d then it is not a capital asset okay second condition last condition third condition the yearly premium you have paid for this ulip at least in one year is more than 250000 in any year you have paid a premium more than 250000 sir what if i am having multiple ulips i have taken two or more ulip policies in that case all the policies put together you should not have paid 250000 at least in a year at least in a let me elaborate this point because this is having connection with other topics also. Let me elaborate this guys. Please pay attention. Now, this is also having relationship with deductions. Please pay attention. Now assume I have taken a ULIP guys. I have taken a ULIP. Okay. For 50 lakhs. Okay. Every year. For 10 years. 10 years. Every year I am paying a premium of 4 lakhs. And yearly premium, I will write yearly premium. Now, you know about the life insurance policy. Life insurance policy will mature on the expiry of the insured, that is the death of the insured or the expiry of the term, whichever is earlier. So the term of this policy is 10 years. I have taken the policy for 10 years. Assume at the end of 10 years, I'm still alive. So I'm receiving the policy amount. Every year, I have paid a premium of 4, 4 lakh. So totally at the end of 10 years, what is the total premium I have paid? 40 lakhs. Okay, sir. 40 lakh. Okay. When policy matures at the end of 10 years, what is the policy amount you are receiving? 50 lakh. 50 lakh. So, did you make any profit out of this? Yes, sir. I am receiving policy amount 50 lakh and total premium I have paid for a period of 10 years is 40 lakh. So, let me remove the total premium from this 40 lakh. So, what is the profit I have made? 10 lakh. So, this 10 lakh is taxable as capital gains. This 10 lakh is taxable as capital gains. When, sir, in the year in which the policy matures. In the year in which policy matures and I receive this 50 lakh rupees. When will I receive this 50 lakh? When policy matures and it is taxable. So, please pay attention now. Now, first of all, should I decide whether this ULIP is a capital asset or not? So, first check when it was taken. Assuming it was taken on or after 1st February 2021. Okay. Then, what is the yearly premium you are paying? 4 lakh. More than 2 lakh 50? Yes, sir. Next. Coming to exemption under section 1010D. Please pay attention. I am trying to connect it to all other place. So, 1010D talks about exemption of insurance policy. Now, here there are two criteria. If the policy matures, policy matures on death yeah. there are two possibilities guys. If the policy matures on the death of the insured of insured then Always it is completely exempt. Completely exempt. Irrespective of how much you have paid premium. Sir, premium I paid more than 2,50,000, more than 5 lakh, doesn't matter. It is completely exempt. And when the policy matures, if it is exempt under section 1010D, no capital gains. Because it is not at all a capital asset. If a ULIP is exempt under section 1010D, then that ULIP is not at all a capital asset. When there is no capital asset, why do you calculate capital gain? There is no capital gain. Clear? Okay, sir. Next, if the policy matures at the of the expiry of the term, that is 10 years, the insured is still alive. In that case, we need to check what is the yearly premium paid. What is the yearly premium paid? Already in 1010D, there is one condition that is, Sir, if the premium is paid more than 10% or 20% of the policy amount, then even in one year, 
if the policy uh, premium paid is more than 10% or 20% of the pol uh, policy amount then exemption under section 1010 d is not available sir when 10% when 20% we have already covered all this in our regular class that is if the policy is taken on or before 31st march 2012 then the maximum premium you can pay is 20% of the policy amount and even if in one year if you have paid a premium more than 20% exemption under section 1010 d is not available same way sir I am uh, take I have taken a policy on or after 1st April 2012. In that case, maximum premium you can pay every year is 10% of the policy amount. 10% of the policy amount. So in that case, even in one year, if you pay more than 10%, you can you cannot claim exemption. Clear? And even whatever yearly premium you pay, deduction is available under section 80C. So there, whatever premium yearly you will pay, you can claim deduction under section 80C. There also they tell maximum deduction is available for 10 or 20 percent of the policy amount. Sir, what if I have paid more than 10 or 20 percent of the policy amount? Then you can claim deduction still, but maximum 10 or 20 percent. Maximum 10 or 20 percent. All this we have seen already. So for this, one more additional condition is you should not pay more than 10 and 20 percent of the policy amount. This is percentage limit and they have added for this ULIP only. For this ULIP only, if you pay more than 2,50,000 per year, then also exemption is not available. That is, you should not pay more than 10% of the policy amount. If the policy is taken on or after 1st February 2021, plus you the amount also should not be more than 2,50,000. Sir, what? The percentage is within 10%, but I have paid a yearly premium of more than 2,50,000 on my ULIP. Then exemption under section 1010D is not available if the policy expire on the term of the policy. Clear? In that case, exemption under section 1010D is not available. So, if exemption, assume, not available, then capital gains has to be computed. Capital gains has to be computed. So, when you leave amount is not available as an exemption under section 1010D and if that policy is taken on or after 1st February 2021, then automatically on the expiry of the policy, then capital gains has to be computed. And how to calculate the capital gains, I have already covered here. I have already explained it. Hope it is clear for you. And all other things remain same. There is no change. Whatever I have given here in black color, the same contents, there is no change in that. Next one is, Year of chargeability. Normally, capital gains is chargeable in the previous year in which transfer takes place. But there are certain exceptions for this. Agree? So, all the exceptions we have covered it. But there is one new exception with respect to ULIP. There is one new exception with respect to ULIP, which I already covered it. Sir, what is this? 451B talks about in which year we are supposed to pay capital gains if a ULIP is a capital asset. So, assume we have paid totally 40 lakhs premium for 10 years. When the policy matures, we are receiving 50 lakh. So, policy amount is 50 lakh. From that, whatever premium you have paid is 40 lakh deducted. So, what is the profit you have made? 10 lakh. That is your capital gain. And this on this capital gain, when should you pay tax? Whenever you are receiving this 50 lakh on the expiry of the policy. That is what section 45 subsection 1b is talking about. Yeah, and all other things remains same with respect to other exceptions. Then coming to deduction, even this I explained it. So under section 80C, whatever premium is paid on life insurance policy was available as deduction. But now they added one more thing that is the premium paid on ULIP is also available for deduction. So what is it? That is what I have elated in A point. Contribution in the name of individual or, is, or, or spouse or any child of the individual for participation in the ULIP 1971 or ULIP of LIC mutual fund in case of HUF, the contribution can be in the name of any member. Now, if I have taken the ULIP in my name or my spouse name or my children's name, whatever premium I pay, I can claim deduction under section 80C. Same way, HUF also can claim deduction under section 80C. If HUF has taken the ULIP policy in the name of any member of HUF, deduction can be claimed for a premium. But here also, there is a restriction. That is, you cannot claim deduction for more than 2,50,000 in a year. Means, see, maximum deduction under section 80C is only 1,50,000. Agree? 
and even for ulip that 10% 20% limit is applicable okay and when the policy matures if ulip is maturing on the death of the insured completely exempt no capital gains nothing but if it matures on the expiry of the term then check what was the yearly premium paid even in one year if you have paid more than 10% premium no exemption is available or even in one year if you have paid more than 250000 premium then you are not eligible for exemption then when you are not eligible for exemption you are liable for capital gains yeah that's what is mentioned in this notes with respect to that 250000 point guys then there is one more change in deductions chapter that is with respect to ATEEA. So ATEEA gives additional deduction for interest on housing loan. That is for self-occupied property. For self-occupied property, already maximum deduction under section 24B, 2 lakh is available. But in addition to that, 1 lakh 50,000 additional interest deduction is available under section ATEEA. But loan should be taken on or before 31st March 22. Actually, previously it was 31st March 21, but now this has been extended to 31st March 2022. Through Finance Act 2021, they have extended it. That is what the change. Previously it was till 31st March 21. Yeah, means loan can be taken up to this date to claim an additional deduction of 1,50,000. Next, coming to Chapter 10, that is with respect to TDS. TCS and provisions of advanced tax. So here, yeah, there is one new section added for TDS. What is that? Before, see, 206AB is a new section, whereas 206AA is a old section, but both are interrelated. So that is why I've given 206AA is also here. What is it? 206AA I am reading. If payee doesn't provide his pan to the payer, then TDS has to be deducted at what rate? 20% or the rate as per the respective section, whichever is higher. In all the cases, except in respect of payment made to a non-corporate, non-resident or foreign companies, because they will not have PAN in India. So if the payee is not giving his PAN to the payer, then the payer will deduct the TDS at whatever rate is given in the respective section or 20%, whichever is higher. Okay, sir. Now, they have added a new section for TDS part. Higher rate of TDS for non-filers of income tax return section 206 ab what is it section 206 ab completely new section guys requires tax to be deducted at source under the provisions of this chapter on any sum or income or amount paid or payable or credited by a person that is deductee to a specified person so specified person here means pay pay at higher of the following rates. Sir, first let us see who is a specified person. I have given you. Who is a specified person? A person who has not filed the return of income for both of the two assessment year relevant to, 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 relevant to the two previous years immediately prior to the previous year in which tax is required to be deducted for which the time limit for filing the return of income under section 139.1. 139.1 gives the due date for filing the income tax return as expired and aggregate of tax deducted at source and tax collected at source in this case is 50,000 or more in each of these two previous year. However, the specified person <coughs> does not include, <coughs> sorry, does not include a non-resident who does not have a permanent establishment in India. So specified person will not include a non-resident who is not having any permanent establishment in India. Okay. Now, Okay, specified person, let me discuss that. Let me explain it. But before that, let me complete it. At the higher of the following rate, that is twice the rate given in the respective section or 5%, whichever is higher. Okay. However, section 206AB is not applicable in case of tax deductible at source under section 192, 92A, 194B, BB and 194N. So for this five section, new section 206AB is not applicable. Yeah, sir, what is it? Come on. Now, coming to the pay, we need to check. Assume we are deducting TDS in previous year 21-22 under the respective sections. I'm not taking particular section under the respective section. Okay. So, check in previous year 20-21 and 19-20 as he filed the returns. As he filed the returns. 
Okay, sir. No, in both the years he has not filed the returns. Okay, and the TDS or TCS collected on his income is is it more than or equal to fifty thousand in both the years? Yes, sir. Both the years. So both the years condition has to be satisfied. So I repeat, in last two years, the payee has not filed the income tax returns, and and the due date to file the returns has expired, as per section one thirty nine one. And the TDS or TCS collected on his income is more than fifty thousand or equal to fifty thousand in the last two years. In that case, in twenty one twenty two, this payee will be treated as specified person. Specified person. And at what rate TDS would be deducted, sir? Two hundred and six AB is telling. Two hundred and six AB is telling. Twice the rate. Assume on for this specified income, the payer is paying the expenses. And he was supposed to deduct TDS at five percent. Let us assume that he was paying some commission or brokerage. TDS was supposed to be deducted at five percent. Okay. So the first point we are telling twice the normal rate. So twice the normal rate means ten percent or five percent. Agree. The second point is telling five percent. I mean five percent is fixed here for all the sections or five percent, whichever is higher, ten percent. Now the payer. When he is paying the amount, irrespective of which payment he is making, he has to deduct TDS at ten percent. Actually, actually, he was supposed to deduct TDS at five percent, assuming commission or broker some amount was paid. So TDS was supposed to be deducted at five percent on that payment, as per the respective section. But payee is a specified person, in which case two hundred and six AB is applicable. Two hundred and six AB first point is telling twice the normal rate. So five percent is the normal rate. Ten percent, uh, twice that is ten percent, or five percent, whichever is higher. How much? Ten percent. So TDS ten percent has to be deducted for the payment to be made for a specified person. Yeah, yes. This is a new section. This paragraph. Another. In case the pro and see for the payments to be made under section one ninety two, one ninety two A, one ninety four B, B B and N. 206 ab is not at all applicable even if the payee is a specified person still tds would be deducted at whatever rate is given in the respective sections next in case the provision of section 206 aa are also applicable to a specified person in addition to provision of this section then tax is required to be deducted at higher of the two rates provided in section 206 aa and section 206 ab sir what is it Now this pay is a specified person. Now, assume he has not given his pan also. He has not given his pan to the payer. So 206 AA is AA also is applicable. Yes, sir. So pay is a specified person, and also he has not given his pan to the payer. So he is also covered under 206 AA. Yes, sir. What 206 AA will tell? TDS should be deducted at normal rate. Normal rate applicable for this person was five percent. Or twenty percent, or twenty percent, whichever is higher. So whichever is higher is twenty percent. So do we deduct TDS under both the section? No. So calculate the rate under each section separately and take whichever is higher. So under section two hundred and sixty A, A A higher was twenty percent. Two hundred and sixty A B higher was ten percent. Higher of this two is how much? Twenty percent. So in this case, TDS has to be deducted at. Twenty percent. If the pay is covered under both the section, then higher of these two sections rate we have to take it. Yeah, one of the important changes or new provision. Same to same provision is also applicable in case of TCS guys. Till now, whatever we discussed was TDS. So two hundred and six CC was an old section, but now they have added a new section called two hundred and six CCA. What was CC? So two hundred and six CC, whatever is given here. So what is it? The provision of this section are as under collecti. That is buyer. TCS is actually collected from the seller by the buyer. Buyer will collect it from the seller. Yes. So collecti buyer shall furnish his pan to the person responsible for collecting such tax at store. If Just a second. Just a second. Small clarification. So TCS would be collected from the seller, means who is selling the goods, along with the amount for the goods, 
you will also collect something called as TCS. Actually, it is collected from the seller by from the buyer. So seller is the collector, buyer is the collectee. <clears throat> okay. If pan is not intimated, that is, if the buyer is not giving his pan to the seller, then tax shall be collected at twice the normal rate, whatever rate is applicable, or 5%, whichever is higher. This was our normal old provision, whichever is higher. Okay. Now, new provision, 206 CCA. It may be noted that where section 206 CC is applicable to a person paying any sum or amount on which tax is collectible at source, who have not furnished PAN, section 206 CCA is applicable to a specified person who have failed to file the return of income. Same person covered under section 206 AB for TDS provision. Sir, what is it? Now, if the buyer is a specified person, sir, who is specified person? Whatever we covered it here, same thing. If buyer has not filed his income tax return in the last two years, and TDS and TCS collected or deducted on his income is 50,000 or more in last two years, then he is a specified person. In that case, 206 CCA would be applicable. And at what rate TCS would be collected? Same as here. That is twice the rate given in the respective section or 5%, whichever is higher. Whichever is higher. Very similar to 260 AB, but 206 AB was on TDS, 206 CCA is on TCS tax. Clear? Sir, what? For the same buyer, he is a specified person and also he has not given his PAN similar. Whatever we did for TDS, the same way. So, if PAN is not given, what is the TCS rate? Twice the normal rate or 5%, whichever is higher. Okay. As per section 206 CC. Next, if the buyer is a specified person, what is the TCS rate? That is whatever is given here. That is twice the normal rate or 5%, whichever is higher. So check what is the higher rate under both the section and take whichever is higher of that. Whichever is higher of that. That will be the rate at which TCS has to be collected from the buyer. From the buyer. Next. And there are two more new sections here. Just a second. For, with respect to TDS, I have given it at the end. There are new two TDS sections added. We will just cover it. TDS chart. It is at the end of the material. Or <clears throat> 194P. P for pension. Try to remember like that. So pension along with interest on bank account. So a person is getting pension along with the interest in the same bank account. Okay. What is the threshold limit? 3 lakh or 5 lakh. Which is a basic essential limit. Who is the payer? Bank. Notified specified bank. Who is the type of P specified senior citizen? Sir, who is he? I have given it here. Let us go through it. Specified senior citizen means an individual being a resident. Okay. Resident individual in India who is of 75 years or more at any time during the previous year. So, he is a senior or super senior citizen. 75 or more means senior or super senior citizen. And for a resident individual who is Senior or super senior citizen, what is the basic essential limit, guys? 3 lakh or 5 lakh. If he is 80 or more, 5 lakh. If he is less than 80, then 3 lakh. Agree, na? Yes. Next. He is having a pension income and no other income except interest income received or receivable from any account maintained by such individual in the same specified bank in which he is receiving his pension income. So, he is earning two income from the same bank. That is interest income. He has kept some FD or any deposits on which he is earning interest income and he is also getting pension income through the same bank. Okay. That is what is called notified specified bank and he has furnished a declaration to the specified bank. So, he has to give a declaration telling that we do, I don't have any other income except this two income. So, in that case, the bank will deduct a TDS at whatever rate is there in the force. That is what bank will do is they will consider what is the basic exemption limit applicable for this individual. See how much is taxable income. What is the tax liability of him? Accordingly, they will decide the rate. So under the act or under the section, rate is not fixed. When TDS has to be deducted at the time of payment of such pension or interest. Clear? So 194P is a completely a new section which is for a pension income of a resident senior citizen of 75 or more. Sir, what if he is less than 75? 
194 p is not applicable other sections might be applicable in that case next 194 q it is on purchase of goods more than 50 lakh in a previous year that is the value of the goods purchased is more than 50 lakh in a year and the buyer is the payer who is responsible for paying any sum to any resident for purchase of goods so the seller is any resident okay next tds has to be directed at what percent 0.1 percent of the sum exceeding 50 lakh that means let me give an example assume i am the buyer who has purchased the goods worth 60 lakh in previous year 21 22 okay and the seller is resident how much tds i should deduct 0.1 percent only on 10 lakh that is the amount exceeding 50 lakh not on entire 60 lakh only on the amount exceeding 50 lakh how much is that 10 lakh in my example so on the 10 lakh the buyer has to deduct 0.1 percent and pay the balance to the seller oh. when tds has to be deducted at the time of credit of such amount to the account of the payee or at the time of payment whichever is earlier there one more condition is there who should be the buyer buyer means a person whose total sales gross receipts or turnover from the business exceeds 10 crore during the financial year immediately preceding the financial year in which the purchase of goods is carried out sir what is it now let me take an example assume a buyer has purchased the goods buyer has purchased the goods that is purchase cost is 90 lakhs let me take 90 lakhs okay in previous year 21 22 is section 194 q straight away applicable no go to the past year check the past of the buyer in 2021 what was the turnover of the buyer assume it was more than 10 crore then only 194 q is applicable then only 194 q is applicable sir what in the uh, previous year 2021 if the turnover of the buyer is less than 10 crore then 194 q is not at all applicable for the buyer yeah so both this condition has to be satisfied what is it the turnover of the buyer in the last year is more than 10 crore and in the current year the value of purchase is more than 50 lakh in that case so how much is more than 50 lakh 40 lakh on this 0.1 percent tds has to be deducted only on that excess part tds has to be deducted is it clear so these are the new, two new sections under tds guys under tds getting back so we are done with tds part then come into chapter 12 which talks about assessment procedure there are two changes here belated return sir what is belated return if the assessee fails to file the return within the due date given under section 139 subsection 1 then he can file belated return and for filing belated return due date is given under section 139 4 what is it any person who has not furnished a return within the time allowed to him under section 139 1 may furnish the return for any previous year at any time before three months prior to the end of relevant assessment year that is 31st December 2022 for previous year 21-22 or before the completion of assessment that is before you compute your income and tax liability whichever is earlier. So let me discuss this for previous year 21-22 which is applicable for your exam what is the assessment year 22-23 okay what is the end of this assessment year 31st March 23 they are telling first point is three months before this three months before this that is 31st December 22 so for the returns of previous year 21 22 if you are willing to file belated return you have to file it before 31st December 22 that is three months before the end of relevant assessment year or before the completion of assessment whichever is earlier and this first bullet point is a change previously it was something else now they have changed it to this yeah yes now coming to revised return revised return when it will be filed sir i am already filed the returns now there was some omission or i have missed certain points in my uh, re return which is already filed or there is some mistake can i correct it yes by filing revised returns and the due date to file revised return is given under section 139 5 and what is it same as belated return same to same point earlier of two dates earlier of two dates and in that the first date has been changed which is the new amendment 
which is same like my belated return guys yeah this is the change with respect to assessment procedure then coming to the last chapter there are few changes here also with respect to time chapter 15 which talks about assessment appeals and revision what is it assessment so under assessment topic there are different types of assessment a b coming to b which is that summary assessment central processing of return cpc we call cpr we call it as under section 143 1 there there is a time limit for intimation under section 143 1 what is it no intimation for the tax or interest due under section 143 1 shall be sent after the expiry of nine months from the end of financial year in which return of income is made so this nine months is a change there so please make a note of it clear next come into scrutiny or regular assessment so if the uh, officer that is income tax officer want to check whether you have filed your return properly whether you have computed your income properly or you have paid your taxes properly you can ask for some evidence you can ask for some evidence how will you ask by serving a notice to you and what is the time limit to serve notice under section 143.2 or 143.3 is given here so let me read it where a return has been made under section 139 that is you already filed the return or in response to notice under section 142 142.1 that is in response to a notice you have filed the return the assessing officer shall if he consider necessary or expedient to ensure that SSC has not understated the income or has not computed excessive loss or has not underpaid the tax in any manner. That is, if the uh, income tax officer or assessing officer want to ensure that you have computed your income properly, you have paid your taxes properly, in that case, he can serve on the SSC a notice requiring him on the date to be specified therein either to attend his office or to produce or cause to be produced there any evidence on which SSC may rely in support of return. That is, he can send a uh, assessing officer can send a notice for you to go and visit him or to submit the evidences. And what is the time limit to issue that notice? Provided that no notice under subsection 2 shall be served on the SSC after the expiry of three months. After the expiry of three months from the end of financial year in which return is furnished. Sir, what is it? Let me assume. So, you have furnished the return for previous year 21-22. So, filing of returns normally will happen in assessment year, obviously. So, you have filed your return in assessment year 22-23. Okay, sir. Now, the assessing officer want to give a notice for you. So, in which year you have filed the returns? 22-23. What is the end of this year? 31st March 23. So, if the assessing officer wants, he can give a notice within three months from year. Maximum that is 30th June 23. Within this date, he has to give a notice for you. Sir, can he give a notice after 30th June? No. Option is at all closed. Next topic. Time limit for completion of assessments and reassessment, which is given in section 153. All the things remain same except the last point. So, what is the time limit to complete the assessment? So, 21 months, 18 months is there with respect to when it is related to. So, C point you can observe. C and D is the change. The time limit to complete the assessment or reassessment was 12 months from the end of the assessment year in which the income was first assessable. So, in our material, we have covered assessment year 2021 20, onward. But this time is applicable only for assessment year 2021 20, and 2122. After that, the time limit is not 12 months, it is 9 months to complete the assessment. So, 9 months from the end of assessment year in which the income was first assessable, assessment year 22-23 onwards. That is, that is the assessment year which is applicable for our exams. So, now the time limit has been reduced to 9 months. Previously, it was 21, then they reduced it to 18, then for 12, now they have reduced it to 9 months. And in all the cases, if the scenario or the reference is made to transfer pricing officer whatever period is given in all the four points it will be extended by another 12 months that is plus 12 months extra will be provided clear guys so this is all about the amendments which are applicable for your june 22 exams 
clear so do study regularly hope it was helpful for you guys so do study regularly and clear it in this attempt guys all the very best bye see you take care enjoy your studies